Thank you for joining us today for part two of the Gastro Plus lecture series, Mechanistic IVIVCs and Virtual VE Trial Simulations. A few housekeeping notes. For optimal video and audio connection, we recommend you close any additional web or streaming applications that may affect your internet bandwidth. We take your privacy rights seriously by attending this event or participating in the Q&A session, you are allowing us to contact you for follow-up. This webinar is being recorded for future playback on our website and our YouTube channel. For the Q&A session, you may ask questions via the questions panel on your dashboard. You may submit queries at any time during the presentation. And if you need assistance, please raise your hand or use the chat function. On behalf of everyone at Simulations Plus, we appreciate you spending the next 90 minutes with us. To get started, please tell us a little bit about yourselves. How familiar are you with Gastro Plus software? We'll give you a few seconds here. Keep those answers coming in. It will definitely help today's presenter go over some of the aspects of the software in detail that you're familiar with, as well as help in the questions and answers session at the end of the presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll now. And it looks like most of you are somewhat familiar with our software, so you're in the right place. Now today, I'm pleased to introduce speaker Joyce Macwan. Joyce is Senior Scientist 2 in the Simulation Studies Group. When she's not working out in her home gym or going for long runs, you can find her consulting on various projects, such as DDI, formulation optimization, and food effects. Her clients include Merck, Sanofi, Dr. Reddy's, and CIPLA, to name a few. With Joyce's extensive experience in mechanistic absorption and PPPK modeling to support model-based drug development, she is the perfect presenter for today's talk. Please welcome my friend and colleague, Joyce Macklin. Joyce, take it away. Thank you, Arlene, for a nice introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking time out from your busy schedule to join today's webinar. So in today's lecture, I will be talking about the IVIVC plus module in Gastro Plus. And with the case example, I will show how you can use IVIVC module to perform either traditional deconvolution or mechanistic deconvolution, and how can you build the correlation between the in vitro and in vivo. And once we establish the IVIVC equation, how we can perform the virtual bioequivalence trial using the population simulator mode in GastroPlus and can assess the bioequivalence between test and the reference product. And later, I will also share a case example in which I will show a link between our DDD Plus and Gastro Plus software. So I will show how you can use the output from DDD Plus as an input in Gastro Plus and how can we establish the dissolution specifications. So we had five years of research collaboration agreement with US FDA to utilize the Gastro Plus mechanistic absorption modeling and to build a robust IVIVC for prediction of complex absorption characteristic with greater accuracy. And the ultimate goal of these collaboration was to facilitate the drug product development by decreasing the burden at regulatory side by applying the appropriate modeling and simulation approach. 
So now let's look at the definition of what is IVIVC. The acronym IVIVC stands for in vitro in vivo correlation. And according to FDA guidance, the definition is it is the mathematical model that defines the relationship between an in vitro, in this case, in vitro dissolution of the formulation and in vivo performance of the drug product. And that would be a plasma concentration time data. So what exactly we are doing in IVIVC, we are trying to find a mathematical function that can correlate the in vitro dissolution profile with the in vivo plasma concentration time data. And once we generate and validate this mathematical function, we can use this mathematical function to predict the plasma concentration time profile for a similar formulations, but with the different in vivo release rate. So how can we use the IVIVC? So establishment of IVIVC can solve several uh, advantages during the drug development, as well as uh, later for the post-approval changes. And the most relevant use of IVIVC that it can act as a surrogate for the human bioavailability or bioequivalent studies which are routinely performed during the drug development process and as well as after the post-approval changes. Let's say if you are making any changes in the manufacturing site or maybe the formulation itself, changing some amount of excipients or API, or maybe the, you are changing equipment. So then you can use IVIVC as a surrogate and you don't have to run certain clinical trials. By doing so, it would allow us to save the time as well as to reduce the cost associated running this clinical trials. IVIVC can also be used for dissolution method development. Let's say if you have performed the mechanistic deconvolution in gastroplast, and you already have the deconvoluted in vivo profile, then you can assess which in vitro dissolution profile best correlates with your in vivo dissolution profile. IVIVC can also be applicable for formulation design. It would allow you to de develop the formulation in order to get the uh, desired in vitro dissolution rate that would allow you to achieve the bioequivalence with the reference listed product. IVIVC is also used to define the safe space for in vitro dissolution profiles. So in this case, let's say if we want to assess the impact of certain parameters that's going to affect the in vitro dissolution profile, such as the uh, dissolution experimental condition itself, or maybe uh, variability arising from the content uniformity. And we would like to know how much variability in all those uh, parameters are allowed and still the product can be a bioequivalent with the reference product. So there are three types of IVIVC and currently only level A IVIVC is possible in the gastroplast which is the highest correlation and it is the most informative. And level A is also preferred for the bio waiver as well. What we do in level A IVIVC, you are doing the point to point relationship between the in vitro dissolution and in vivo input rate, which can be a linear or non-linear. In level B, the in vitro dissolution time, they are correlated with the mean residence time. While in case of level C, it's the single point relationship in which a single dissolution parameter, uh, let's say in example, the time uh, where the 50% drug dissolves and correlating that with the PK parameters such as Cmax and the AUC. 
So now let's look at for which VCS class the IVIVC is possible or which have a limited application. For class one, the compound is high soluble and high permeable. So it's possible if the dissolution is identified as a rate limiting step. For class two, if the in vitro and in vivo dissolutions are similar, then IVIVC is possible. For class three, the compound has a low permeability and hence the absorption becomes the rate limiting step. So IVIVC might be limited or maybe not possible. When it comes to class four, for low soluble and low permeable compound, which we might not expect IVIVC unless the dissolution is identified as a limiting step. So now let's look at what input are required to build the level A IVIVC and what output do we get from IVIVC. So first you need is in vitro dissolution data for your different formulation such as slow release, intermediate release, fast release and you would also need corresponding in vivo data for these formulations. In addition to that, you would also require either IV PK data or maybe solution or IR formulation data in order to build and verify the underlying PK model, which can be a compartmental PK model or can be a PBPK model. In output, the first step involves in IV IVC is the deconvolution, which calculates the rate of in vivo input using the plasma concentration time profile and previously determined PK parameters. In step two, after the deconvolution, correlation is being made. For level A, it's a point to point correlation between the in vitro dissolution and in vivo input rate, which can be an absolute viability in case of traditional deconvolution method or it can be in vivo dissolution versus time profile in case of mechanistic deconvolution. And we'll talk about those differences in upcoming slides. So in step one is the deconvolution and GastroPlus does offer traditional method for deconvolution. So users have option to select model dependent options which are wagner lenson if you have one compartmental PK model, or you can choose Lou Riegelman if you have two or third compartmental PK model. GastroPlus does offer the model, in model independent option as well, which is the numerical deconvolution method. In traditional method, what program calculates is the fraction Biobility. So it's a percentage F versus the time code. It's not the dissolution or absorption. So now let's look at what are the drawbacks with traditional methods. So, of course, traditional methods, they are easy to use, but they are severely constrained with several limitations. Because the output we get from the traditional method is the systemic availability the rate of appearance of a drug in the systemic circulation. So it doesn't tell us anything how the drug made it to the systemic circulation. It doesn't allow us to separate the mechanism. What happened during absorption or was there any drug lost during the first pass restriction in gut or in liver? So it doesn't tell anything about those processes that happens before the drug reaches to systemic circulation. And since we cannot separate the in vivo and absorption profile, if we do the traditional deconvolution, we cannot correlate the in vitro plasma profile with in vivo uh, release profile. The assumption traditional methods uh, takes into account is the drug obeys either one, two or three compartmental models. So if the, it doesn't consider the drug's true uh, disposition, it also assumes that it follows the first order absorption, 
which might not be true. It also assumes that the drug follows the linear PK. But what if the drug exhibits the nonlinear PK because of saturations of metabolism, of the resaturable absorption? What if the drug is a substrate of any transporter? And traditional method also assumes that the terminal plasma concentration time points, they are independent of absorption. But we do know that for some formulation, there might be a significant colonic absorption happening. In that situation, the traditional methods are not applicable. And in GastroPlus, we do offer the GastroPlus mechanistic absorption method. In that method, what a program does, it utilizes the full capability of the ACAT model. That's the mechanistic absorption model, advanced compartmental absorption transit model. And it provides the in vivo dissolution versus time profile. So this is not the viability that we get from the traditional deconvolution. What we get from the mechanistic is the in vivo dissolution versus time. Since we are using the full uh, ACAD model, the inputs are required in addition to the traditional methods are physiological parameters. You would also need to provide the drug dependent properties to the uh, model. So you need to enter the solubility data, the permeability data of the compound, as well as the physicochemical properties of the compound. So once we integrate, all the available information from in vitro, in vivo, and in silico, the program can provide you the in vivo dissolution profile, the absorption profile, as well as the uh, drug that reaches to systemic circulation. Because when we do mechanistic absorption, it allows us to separate all the mechanism, dissolution, absorption, and the uh, extraction happening in gut and the liver. Since we are using the mechanistic absorption model, you can also uh, estimate the regional dependent absorption, how much drug is being absorbed, say in the upper part of GI tract versus the distal part of a GI tract. So that kind of information you would get from uh, as an output using the mechanistic deconvolution method. And it would also allow you to uh, estimate how much uh, first pass extraction happened in gut versus liver. So in this figure, this is easy to understand uh, the difference between the traditional and mechanistic deconvolution. So as I mentioned earlier, when you do traditional deconvolution, what you get is the uh, drug reaches in systemic circulation the viability. But there are several processes happen before the drug reach to systemic circulation. So in case of traditional deconvolution, we don't know what happened before the drug reach to systemic circulation. So everything serves as a black box here. But in case of a mechanistic deconvolution, it calculates the in vivo dissolution in the gut lumen. And once the drug is dissolved, the dissolved drugs it gets absorbed either through passive diffusion or can, or can be a carrier-mediated transport, role of influx or efflux transporter at the gut apical membrane. And if the drug is a substrate of any enzyme which are highly expressed in gut, it may undergo the first pass extraction in gut and the remaining drug will enter into the portal vein. Once the drug reaches in systemic circulation in liver, the drug undergo further metabolism and remaining drug reaches to the systemic circulation. So in mechanistic deconvolution, it allows us to separate the dissolution, the absorption, what happened uh, for the first pass effect in gut versus liver, and hence, the program estimates the amount dissolved. This is what you get, the red line here, from the deconvoluted profile from mechanistic deconvolution method. The program will also give you how much amount of drug is absorbed. 
and how much drug reach into systemic, uh, sorry, portal vein. If there is a gut first pass effect, it takes into account and it estimates how much drug is entered into portal vein. And the green line here is the viability line, the drug that reaches the systemic circulation. So this is what we get from the deconvolution if you if we use traditional methods so it ignores what happened before that and the red line here the in vivo dissolution this is what program calculates if we use the mechanistic deconvolution and it it gives it allows us to separate the dissolution from the absorption and all other processes before the drug reaches to systemic circulation the second step after uh, for the deconvolution in the mechanistic absorption, the first we need to fit the in vivo release profile using the viable function that best fits the plasma concentration time data for each formulation that's used in IV IVC. And once we get the deconvoluted in vivo dissolution, we can correlate that in vivo dissolution with in vitro using the uh, correlation function in the gastroplast. So you could use the optimization module and optimization of in vivo release profile in a form of viable function can be done using this module. The gastroplast offers a single, double and triple viable functions to fit the uh, in vivo release profile. If you have a formulation with a complex release characteristic, the triple viable function can explain the shape of the release profile. So you have a flexibility in GastroPlus to choose either single, double or triple, which covers the wide variety of release shapes. So the first, after the first step, which was deconvolution the second step is correlation so what in correlation we do we correlate the in vitro dissolution profile with the in vivo input rate which can be a uh, absolute viability in case of traditional deconvolution method or it can be a in vivo dissolution data in case of a mechanistic deconvolution method and we do have a uh, built-in several function in the program for the correlation that includes linear function, power function, second and third order, order polynomial equations. And you could also use uh, the time shift and scaling function, but which is that is only available with the mechanistic deconvolution. And it, you cannot use this with the traditional deconvolution method. The step three in IV IVC is convolution. What convolution means is the program uses the IV IVC equation and it plugs the in vitro dissolution data and it back calculates either the absolute viability in case of traditional methods or in vivo dissolution in case of mechanistic deconvolution method and it predicts the plasma concentration time profile. And convolution steps allows us to evaluate the internal and external predictability of the IV IVC equation. For internal validation, you need to use the formulation that you already used to develop the IV IVC equation. But for external validation, you would require a formulation, additional one, that you did not include in constructing this IV IVC equation. And then you need to compare this uh, statistical output with the acceptance criteria provided by the FDA guidance. For the internal validation, according to FDA, the absolute prediction error for both CMAX and AUC for each formulation should not be greater than 15%. And the mean absolute prediction er error shouldn't exit 10%. When it comes to external validation, the limit for absolute prediction error is 10%. So now I'll be uh, showing the uh, hands-on example 
and I will show how to use IVIVC plus module and how we can perform the deconvolution and establish IVIVC and how can we perform validation of that equation. So we'll be using this literature data. This was published in 2005. And in this publication, they provided in vitro resolution data for ER formulation of valproate sodium with a different release rate. So they had a fast formulation, slightly fast release. They had a medium, slightly slow and slow. And for all these five formulation, they also had corresponding plasma concentration time profile. They used the slow, medium and fast in the internal validation. And they also had additional formulation with slightly fast release and slightly slow release. And that's what they used in the external validation. In addition to these plasma concentration profile, they also had the concentration time profile following IV administration. And that is what we used to fit the two compartmental model in gastroplast for traditional deconvolution method. So let me uh, open up the gastroplast. And I have already opened the uh, valproic acid database. So let me just first give you the overview of the database. So this is the gastroplast database for valproic acid. And if I click on this drop down menu, you can see there are several records are already created because we don't have time to uh, create the database uh, in this short webinar. So the first record here, valproic acid is AP 9.5 is the in silico record, which has the properties calculated from our admit predictor software. If you are licensing admit predictor software, when you import the structure, the program can calculate physicochemical and biopharmaceutical properties of the compound just based on the chemical structure. Then the second record is the IV infusion record, right? So we use this literature data, the .ipd file has plasma concentration time profile from this publication, which I showed in my slide. And we fitted the two compartmental model to this data. Then we created other records. So we created all the records for different formulation. So this is the record for the slow formulation. And for each record, we have loaded the in vitro dissolution data under .dsd files. So maybe I can quickly show here. So these are the in vitro dissolution data for the slow release formulation. And .opd file has the plasma concentration time profile for this slow release because that's what we need, right? We need the CP time profile, concentration time profile in plasma as well as the in vitro resolution. And we do have similar setup for all other formulations. You also see that I have the same slow formulation with the record name that ends with PBPK. The difference between the third record and the record that says PBPK is just the PK model is different. For these record, instead of this two compartmental model, we have the full PBPK model. And I will be using this model when I conduct the virtual trial because that would allow us to create the population of interest. And I have other records as well, the slightly slow and slightly fast that I'll be using for the external validation. So I have a several records in the database which I created for to build the IVIVC and also later to perform the virtual BE trial simulation. So when I click modules IVIVC, the program will uh, read all the records before it loads the IVIVC. And I would like to show one feature that most of the user, they are not aware of. You can always subset the records. If you want to, you know, fit any model parameters across say first three records. So you always have ability to sub subset the record. The way you do, you go to database and then you click on this uh, subset by and you have several options, either any part of a drug name or any part of a name and so on. 
what I did, I just uh, added my initial in the notes section for the records that I would like to use in IVIVC. And I'm going to sort a uh, subset these records by the part of the notes with my initial. And now when I click on the drop down menu, you only see four records, right? Previously you saw many records, but now we are only seeing the four records. I'll be using the first three records to build uh, the IV IVC equation. And then I can use this additional formulation slightly fast for the external validation. So now you can, if you have the optionally licensed module IVIVC, then you will have access to this module. So module, click IVIVC plus. And then program opens up this uh, IVIVC module. Now you are seeing four records because I subset the records in the beginning. And then I'll be using the first three records to build the IVIVC equation. So when I choose the records, the program loads the in vitro dissolution profile from .dsd file, which I showed you under support file section in the database. When I click on in vivo tab, the program automatically loads plasma concentration time profile for corresponding formulation. So for slow, moderate and fast. Under IVIVC, the user has a choice which records they would like to use for IVIVC, either two or three combination of two you could use or the three. The ideal is three and we do have the data for it. So let me select all first three records. Now we need to tell the program after we select the record, which deconvolution method we would like to use. And you can see that we offer traditional method option as well as the mechanistic absorption model option as well. First, we will go with the traditional method. So since the uh, PK model we fitted, which was two compartmental model, I'm going to select the two compartmental Lou Riegelman model, and I'm going to deconvolute the plasma profile using the traditional methods. And it will take a while, so maybe we can wait. And now you can see that the program has plotted fraction in vitro versus the fraction absolute viability. Why? Because we chose the traditional method, two compartmental Lou Riegelman method, which is the traditional method for deconvolution and hence program calculates the fraction absolute viability. And now we need to, the second step after deconvolution is the correlation. We need to find the correlation that can best fit this fraction absolute viability and fraction in vitro release profile. And program picked up the power function from all this function that we have selected based on the best statistical fit. So based on the lowest AIC, the program picked the power function. After the second step, the third step is convolution. In convolution, let's first select the first three. I am selecting the first three records which are used in development of IVFVC equation. So that's called the internal validation. So what program does, program uses this equation, right? That we just correlated the in vitro and in vivo. And it plugs the in vitro release profile as a X and calculates the Y that is the fraction absolute viability. And that information along with the PK parameter and then it predicts the plasma profile and it shows the comparisons of the observed with the uh, predicted plasma profile. And it also gives this validation statistics. And you can see that uh, the prediction error for the moderate one was around 16%. So the moderate formulation was outside of internal predictability, right? We could not. Uh, it should be below 15% according to FDA guidance. So now let's try the 
mechanistic deconvolution and see whether we can better correlate the in vitro and in vivo data. When you choose mechanistic absorption model, you need to fit the viable function to in vivo dissolution profile. And you have three options that you could choose from. Let's go for the single viable function and I'm going to let the program to estimate the initial values for the single viable parameters. If you uncheck this function and the program is asking me to save the optimization results so you can save this. If you uncheck this function, the program opens up the viable uh, function form and if you have already determine the pre-optimized Bible function parameter, you can manually enter those and it will speed up the optimization. Since we don't have time, I'm going to stop the optimization. Currently program is fitting the Bible function to the slow release formulation. And I'm going to just pause it and it will move to the second formulation since we don't have time. But our recommendation is you let the integrator to converge and find the best set of values for this viable function for all the formulation. So it finished two and now it's moved to the third one. And again, we don't have time. I'm going to stop this. So now let's see what program has plotted here, right? So now it's a Y axis is in vivo release. Why? Because we use the mechanistic absorption model. In case of Lurie Gunmel, the program calculated absolute viability. But when we do mechanistic, it calculates in vivo dissolution. And that's what it plotted against the in vitro. And then the second step is similar. We need to find the best correlation function. The black line here is the IVIVC fits. Program has identified the second order polynomial function based on the lowest AIC value. And then I would like to save this IVIVC. So you have the ability to save this equation. It will save under IVC file in the data in the folder. And now we can do the internal validation. I'm also going to choose the last one external as well, just to speed up the process. Again, the program is doing the same thing. It plugs the X, which is the in vitro in this equation. Back calculates Y, which is the fraction in vivo release because we did the mechanistic deconvolution and it will use that information to construct the plasma profile. And it's shows the predicted plasma profile versus the observed plasma profile because we did have the observed data for this. Now let's look at the person prediction error for the Cmax. And you can see for first three formulation, which was we used to build the IVAVC equation. So internal validation, it meets the criteria that the person prediction error is below 15%. And this one, for the external is below 10%. I think it's not properly aligned. So maybe I can just copy in the Excel spreadsheet just to see uh, better aligned data. So first three are used for the internal validation, right? And the percent prediction error is below 15% for Cmax as well as AUC. So it meets the criteria for the internal validation and this Slightly fast formulation I use as external because I did not use this data to build the equation. And if you see the person prediction error was less than 10%, uh, which meets the uh, criteria for the internal valid external validation proposed by the FTA. So you could see that when we use the mechanistic deconvolution method, the program better correlated the in vitro with the in vivo dissolution data. So now let me go back to the slide. We already discussed the uh, example. And now let's talk about how can we use this established IVIVC function to run the virtual BE trials. So in Gastroplus, you can use the population simulator mode. 
and that would allow you to generate a maximum 2500 subjects and in gastro plus we don't have any predefined database so it's not we are sampling the subjects from already predefined database but it generates uh, randomly the subjects based on monte carlo sampling using the predefined distribution for all the parameters in the model which include physiological parameters pk parameters as well as parameters related to the formulation itself the particle size or the dose release profile so it you can take into account for all the model parameters the program also allows you to save the population that you created and you could reuse this population to run a crossover trials we don't have the covariate model yet in the mod current version it's a very complex issue but we do uh, integrated and updated the algorithm to account better the known physiological covariates in a version 9.6. So we know that everyone is different, right? Uh, we are different, age is different, the gender, the weight, the health status. So each and every person is different. And in population simulator, we can account for all the variabilities that could arise from differences in the uh, demographic or the health or the disease state and the pk parameters itself so when we click on population simulator mode this is what you see in the program that it loads all the model parameters with the lower mean value upper limit and percentage cv and after the population is being created what we get as the output the green band here is the 90 percent confidence interval for the virtual subjects the solid blue line in the center is the average of the virtual profiles and the light blue lines here these are the probability contour for the virtual subjects if you already have the observed data saved in the opd file the program will show those mean profile as the pink points here and if you have the 90% percent CV associated with this each time point, program will show that as a percent CV. If not, it will show the 80 to 125% B limits for each time point. And once we finish the population simulator, the program will provide the summary of population results. So it will provide the mean percent CV, what is the minimum, what is the maximum value for fraction absorbed or all the PK parameters. In addition to that, what is the confidence interval for all these parameters for log transform or non-log transform data along with the geometric mean. And this all output is saved in the .stc file, which is the population file. So you can open up that in the Excel and you can review what mod, what uh, program has used to create the virtual subject and what was the output that you obtained from the virtual subjects. So now uh, we are going to run a case study for the virtual BE trials. So BE trials, they are used to demonstrate the bioequivalence between the test and the reference formulation. And once we run the BE trials, we need to see whether the Cmax and the AUC, they are within the B limits of 80 to 125% percent or not. And of course, the BE outcome is highly dependent on number of subjects that you use to run a trial. Let's say if you have a small subject size, there are chances the trial might fail. And of course, you will go for a big one. You, it requires a lot of time and the money investment. But virtual trials, uh, they, are, they, they are helpful. They can predict what is the likelihood for the formulation to be a bioequivalent with the reference listed drug. So it will allow you to make an important decision uh, for your prototypes. And the best way to run virtual trial is uh, by choosing this uh, enough number of the subjects and running the crossover trial to confirm the consistent trend for both Cmax and the AUC ratio. So before I get to this case study, 
I would like to take a break here and Aline, we can go for the ne next poll question. Perfect. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, so far, we appreciate your demo and everything we've seen. Quick question to the audience here. What platform do you currently use to develop your PVBM or PVPK models? You can choose all that apply and we'll give you a couple of seconds here while Joyce prepares for the next part of the presentation. All right, we're going to go ahead and close the poll now. Thank you, Joyce. Continue on. Thank you, Aling. So now I'm going to show how can we use this established IVIVC equation and how can we assess the virtual uh, bicovalence using the virtual trial simulation for test and the reference product. So let me go back to the database and now I am going to show all the records which I already created. So you can go to database and click on number six and it will bring back all the records which were previously created in the database. So let's see if you have any test formulation. So any prototypes for that formulation, you only have in vitro resolution data. Okay. And here for this record, we only have the in vitro resolution data loaded in DOS DST file. And I would like to assess whether this test prototype is bioequivalent with the reference listed product or not. So what you need to do here for this record, we have the PBPK model. So it's exactly the same. Um, all the other properties are same. Of course, only the PK model is different. We have created the PBPK model for American male 22 years old and 82 uh, body with 82 kilogram body weight. So first what you need to do, you need to convert the in vitro to in vivo. So what you can do, you can go to file, load and .crd file. And then you can click on tools, calculate CRD from IVIVC and the program is asking you to load the IVC function. So I am going to click there and we are going to use the dot, uh, the correlation that we just built in uh, using the IVIVC plus module. So I'm going to select that and what program does here, it uses the second order polynomial, right? That we created in the IVIVC plus module. It plugs the X, which is the X in vitro and it calculates the Y, which is in vivo. So in vitro is shown here in the blue data points, which are plugged in into this equation and converted to in vivo, which are shown here in red line, which is the, and you can see that up to 12 hour, the in vivo was faster as compared to in vitro based on this IVAVC equation. And then I'm going to say, okay. And then the program shows the same profile. So even though it's a blue color here, these are the in vivo dissolution data that we calculated using the IVIVC function and in vitro this .dst file. When you run a virtual trial, you need to fit the viable function to this pair, uh, tabulated data points. So I'm going to click on fit viable and let's just fit simple single viable parameters and okay and now program saves those single viable parameters in the same .crd file along with the calculated in vivo dissolution profile and i am going to save this so now you can see once i see the, for the time being we have only in vitro dissolution data once i save this file you're gonna see the dot crd and the support file so which has the calculated in vivo dissolution data along with the single viable function which we fitted to this in vivo dissolution time points and before you run the simulation what you need to do you need to run the single simulation and program opens up this form and it's asked you to 
select the appropriate option. So since we have the tabulated data points, right? The in vitro resolution in .dst file, we converted those in vitro resolution data points into in vivo and saved as a .crd. And then we fitted the viable function to this .crd file. So you will have all the three options available to you. But for the virtual trial, we need to make sure we always use the viable function fitted to the in vivo dissolution data point. So that's what I'm going to do first. And then what we are going to do, we are going to generate the population. So for that, you need to click on this population simulator and it will open up the population simulator, which I showed earlier in my slide. Now you can see the program since we use the viable function right to account for the variability in dissolution for taste formulation. It shows up here. All the model parameters, physiological PK parameters, all are here and I am going to use the default distribution for this example and will only generate uh, some small number of data points. And I'm going to only generate the small pilot study. Uh, here, since we have a PBPK model, you have an option to select the population. So American, Japanese or Chinese, you can also select a population of healthy or maybe a liver, uh, liver patients or maybe the subjects with renal impairment or even the pregnant women. The program also allows you to uh, provide the ratio for the gender. So here we are going to generate the 50-50 male and female, but you have the option and you can generate any ratio that you would like. You have an ability to provide the age range. Maybe I'll go with 21 and 40. And you also have the ability to provide the weight range and the BMI range. This is only possible with the PBPK model because it used this pair physiology. If you have a compartmental model, we cannot create the population of the interest. Okay, so now I'm going to say OK and I'm just going to generate small sample size, only 12 subjects. So what program does, it randomly picks up the values for all these parameters from the using the Monte Carlo sampling approach from the predefined distribution. And it, sim it simulates the uh, subjects as it simulates different virtual subject, it provides the uh, simulated fraction absorb, fraction dose on portal vein, viability, and all the Cmax and AUC, all the PK parameters here. And it also shows on the side which parameter is, is changing while it's doing the uh, simulation. But once you create the population, program saves all this information in the .stc file. So you can just simply open up the .stc file and it would allow you to see uh, which parameters were used to run the simulation. So once it's finished, it gives the summary as I showed you, as I told you in the uh, earlier, and you can find same in the DOS STC file. If I click on the new plot, you see this 90% confidence interval for virtual subject. The center line here is the mean of the virtual subject. If I click on probability contour, it shows me the probability for all the virtual subjects. So once I created the virtual population, now I'm going to use the same population and run a crossover trial. So now I will go to the reference one. For reference, we do have in vitro as well as in vivo profile. So the first step is the same as we did for the test. We need to convert in vitro to in vivo. So convert the .dst file to .crd. And again, tools, calculate CRD. I'm going to load same IVC file and program will calculate in vitro to in vivo and it will shows up this data in the tabulator format, but we must fit the viable in order to run the virtual B trials. So I'm going to just fit the single viable and save this .crd file. 
and before we run population we need to make sure we select the correct option so viable fitted to the in vivo dissolution data point and i'm gonna let uh, run this finish because we do have the observed data for the reference and you can see that when we cal calculated in vivo dissolution from the equation it nicely captures the plasma profile for the reference now i'm going to click on population simulator and i am going to run a crossover trial so in order to run a crossover trial you need to click on load previous and i will select the dot stc file which which i created uh, in my previous run which has all the 12 virtual subjects so when i selected what you see some of the rows are blue right so what program will do because i want to use the same subject so these are the fixed model parameters and it will be exactly used as it created in the first uh, uh, run and only the parameters in the whites so the only formulation release related parameters will worry in this uh, simulation so i'm going to again we are using the same population so we can't change anything we want to run crossover trial and using the same population and let let's run the uh, simulation so it might take a while to get to the 12 subjects and again the program is showing how it's changing uh, different parameters and values so while it finishes i'm gonna quickly go through the uh, the other example the synergy between ddd plus and the gastro plus so we do have another program called ddd plus which is the software for the in vitro dissolution modeling and ddd plus can be best used in conjunction with the gastro plus so what you could do let's say if you have a reference formulation and you calculated the in vivo dissolution using gastro plus uh, using the observed plasma concentration time data then you can use that deconvoluted in vivo dissolution profile so the output of gastro plus as the input in ddd plus and you can design the in vitro dissolution method that would allow you to match this target deconvoluted in vivo dissolution profile the other scenario let's say you already design a formulation and you want to simulate the variability in the in vitro dissolution and you can generate the in vitro virtual in vitro dissolution profile in ddd plus that's what we'll be doing in the next example so you can take the output of ddd plus as the input in gastro plus and that would allow you to simulate the pk profiles or run a virtual crossover trials so as i said earlier the ddd plus can be used to determine the safe space so let's say if I have a test prototype and I would like to know how much uh, variability is allowed in that formulation in terms of content uniformity, how much API can be changed or the excipients can be changed or the particle size distribution. So all these parameters that's going to contribute to the variability in vitro dissolution profile, you can generate the virtual in vitro dissolution profile in the gastroplast. And you can take this high dissolution profile this is the high limit of dissolution and also the low limit of dissolution so two extremes of dissolution profile by counting this variability and you can take into the gastro plus and see how that's gonna translate into in vivo and you can run a virtual be trial and can assess whether your high dissolution profile is bioequivalent with the low dissolution profile so ddd plus uh, i'm not going to spend much time since we don't have uh, much time left but it's the state of art computer program and here what you need to do you need to develop the model for your formulation so you need to first define your formulation in the program by specifying the ingredients all the excipients and once you do that the program has the equation that can account for dissolution rate for api and the excipients it can also account for the particle size distribution for both api and excipients we already have several 
built in do uh, we already have several dosage form several ir as well as control release bead coating delay re delay re release coated tablet as well as control release polymer matrix swellable and non swellable so we do have several dosage form that you could model the program also takes into account the dynamic solubility and microclimate ph for both api and the excipients that is calculating the ph at the surface of api and excipients as they are dissolving and also dynamic change in the uh, bulk of the dissolution medium we already have several recipes in the program so you can use several built in buffers or you can also create custom uh, customized buffer as well and we do have several ingredients already included so you can choose those from the database we have included the several apparatus for the compendial and recently we also included the artificial stomach duodenum biphasic dissolution model as well as membrane dissolution model we recently hosted a ddd plus webinar and we are uh, the recordings is already available on our website so if you are interested in knowing more details about the ddd plus i would uh, encourage you to listen to that webinar so let me go back to the uh, Castro Plus and see whether the reference is by QL and fit test or not. So it's done. I'm going to cl click on new plot and let me uncheck the observed data for the reference. So what you see here, and let me also paste the output on the side. So now you can see that the green one here is the reference and the pink one here is the test. And you see in the right, right, uh, this plot is the output from the BE calculation. And what we see here, the point estimates, as well as the 90% confidence interval for CMAX and the AUC, they are within the BE limits. So we can see that the test product is bi-equivalent with the reference. So now let's move on this third case study, which is the uh, establishment of the dissolution specification. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to open the DDD plus. And I will open the DDD plus database. So the way you build gastro plus database, you need to build the DDD plus database. In this database, what we have is the all five formulation from this uh, publication that we have been using for Valproate. So again, it's for the Valproate and we have defined all the formulation in the database. With the API and all the excipients, lactose, HPMC, which is the control release polymer in this case. And what we will do first, we will use two records out of these five formulation, two records that says at the end OPT optimized and will fit the uh, release model parameters across this record. So in order to do so, you need to go to database and again subset by part of formulation. So OPT is the common word in this record. So now it's going to show me only two records and then you can use uh, optimization module and fit across two records so you need to make sure that you choose this all records and not the selected record and then we are going to fit value while proit calibration constant and the release constant so you we are going to fit this two release model parameters and then you optimize this but since we don't have time i it will take a time so i'm going to skip that i already have saved the optimized values for these parameters and just let's run single simulation and see how it fits the data and you can see that is nicely fits the fast release formulation and it also nicely fits the slow release formulation and then what you need to do we need to make sure that the fitted model parameters also works for the other new formulation so we'll have a confidence in this fitted values and i'm going to go this fast release and just run once and see and you can see that the simulated dissolution profile matches well with the observed experimental in vitro dissolution data point now i want to account for the variability 
in the dissolution profile. So what you could do the way we generated virtual subject in Castro plus we can generate virtual subject in the DDD plus. So you click on virtual trial and then you have a choice to select the parameters and there are several options. You can account the variability in the dissolution profile from the experiment itself or any formulation related parameter processing or physicochemical. So I'm just going to select only the amount of API and the amount of exhibients. And I don't expect much uh, variability in the API content. So I'm going to decrease the percent CV to three. We don't need many data points. I can only just generate 25. So now what program is doing, it's, it's uh, taking different amount from API and XCPN from the predefined distribution and generating this virtual dissolution profile. And that's what we see here, right? So this is the high dissolution profile versus the low, low dissolution profile. And I want to see whether this high and the low, they are bioequivalent with each other or not. So now what you can do, you can actually export this in vitro dissolution data point, which can be easily read in the gastro plus. I can just name this slightly fast virtual trial. Okay, and now what we're gonna do, we're gonna take this high dissolution profile and low dissolution profile from DDD plus into the gastro plus and we'll, re we'll run the virtual BE trials. So let me close this and open up the gastro plus. And open up the same database while pro it. I have already created the record for high dissolution limit and low dissolution limit. Right? We don't have any data. Why? Because we are going to take the high dissolution profile from virtual trials from DDD plus to here. So we need to load this in vitro dissolution data point. So file open and that you can find in the DDD plus folder. So program has provided the maximum mean, median and minimum. So I'm going to select this maximum release and save this DOS DSD file. And again, the next step is convert the DOS DST into DOS CRD, right? So convert the in vitro to in vivo using the previously built IVC file. So it's the same step that we have done earlier. Again, make sure to fit the viable function. And I'm going to save this uh, file here. So now we will see dot CRD. And we need to make sure we load the correct dissolution input before we run the virtual trial. So in this case, I'm going to create a new population just to save time. So I will now simulate only six subject. Half what I did earlier, we could use the previous one as well. Since we don't have much time, I'm going to just run a small sample size, but the number of samples can significantly affect the uh, B outcomes. Let's wait for a few seconds. It should be done soon. And then program has created the population, right? Virtual subject, the way we did earlier. So now I'm going to go to the high resolution proof, low resolution and do the same exercise. So load the in vitro resolution that we obtain from DDD plus through virtual trial. So now I'm going to load minimum. Save the file, so in vitro. And again, convert those to in vivo. So same steps using this previously built IVC file. Okay, and then we'll fit the viable as we have been doing for the virtual simulation and then save that. So now we converted the .dst into .crd. In vitro data points are converted to in vivo. Again, make sure to select the correct option. So viable in CRD 
and we know we don't need to finish the simulation we can just because it's already loaded the correct input we go to population simulator now we again want to do crossover trial so i'm going to load previous and the six subject that i just created using the high profile and let's run the trial so till it finishes maybe i can just go to the summary slide So what we have discussed today, uh, applied correctly, IVIVC can be used as a surrogate for the human virtual BE trials. We have learned the differences between the traditional and gastro plus mechanistic absorption. When you use the mechanistic absorption method, it allows you to separate your in vivo from absorption and the first pass extraction. And you can use DDD plus in conjunction with gastro plus to define the dissolution specification by taking the low and the high limit dissolution profile from DDD plus into the gastro plus. So let me just go back to these and see what results we got. And the pink one here is test and the green one, so the pink one here is the uh, high and the reference is the low, the slightly low, you can see that. The BE is shown in the green box here, that means the point estimates and the 90% confidence interval, they are within the B limits. So the high extreme and the low extremes, they are bioequivalent with each other. So any profile that will fall between this release must be bioequivalent with the reference formulations. And now I would like to end the session. So thank you everyone for your attention. And now I'm happy to take any questions that you might have for me. Thank you, Joyce. Your presentation was definitely insightful. Audience, today we are full steam ahead with an all-female panel. The Q&A moderator I'm about to present was highlighted in Scientist.com's 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, celebrating 19 women in STEM. Viera Lukachova shared the virtual stage with Marie Curie and other remarkable scientists alike. As the Director of Simulation Sciences, she contributes to the modeling studies and software development of GastroPlus helping companies worldwide with their drug development programs in different stages of the development process, as well as interactions with regulatory agencies. Please welcome to today's webinar and Q&A session, Simulations Plus Disc Golf Champion, Viera Likachova. Viera, take it away. Thank you, Arlene, for the nice introduction. <laughs> Uh, we have a few questions here um, related to Joyce's presentation, so uh, let's get straight to it. Um, um, how is the, related to the virtual trial simulations, um, how is the virtual trial variability obtained? Okay, so in this case, uh, for the Valproate, since we don't have any individual data, right? So what we did, we just used the uh, default setting. So all the default parameters with their uh, default distribution for percentage CV. But in ideal case, what you should be doing, let's say if you have the individual data for your reference formulation, then you need to load all the individual data point in the OPD file instead of the average plasma profile. And first, you need to run the single simulation, uh, population simulation with default setting and see whether this uh, virtual subjects, they are representative of actual subject that you used in that study. If not, then you need to adjust the person CV for the parameters which are likely to contribute most to the variability for this compound. So you might have some info, let's say if you are building the model from the already well characterized compound, which is in the literature itself, you will get a lot of information from the literature. So you would know what are the sources of variability for this uh, compound. The other thing you could do, if you have individual data, you can model the uh, subject with the highest exposure and subject with the lowest uh, plasma concentration time profile 
and then you can determine uh, what are the reasons what are the what is the reason for the variability between these two subject is there a uh, distribution related to body weight difference or is the clearance are difference right so you can model few representative subjects from your all individual data and you can understand uh, what is the sources of variability for that parameter and you can adjust those person cv into the population simulation and then you need to run multiple population simulation till your virtual subjects are representative of a actual study subject used in the clinical study based on this individual plasma concentration time profile but that's what you need to do ideally if you have individual data Thank you, Joyce, for uh, that extensive explanation of the process of how to verify that the virtual trial um, or the virtual population reproduces well the actual variability for your given drug uh, or formulation. Um, one uh, question specific or starting from the Valproid example. And with the Valproid ex example, it is a three-way crossover study. So the same subjects receive all formulations. Um, can this approach um, be used if the data did not come from a crossover clinical study, but three separate clinical trials with different groups of subjects and different formulations were used in a so real study? I, mm -hmm. Ideally, uh, it should be a crossover studies, right? So you we, we have a same variability in the PK and the variability then only arises from the formulation itself, right? Let's say if you have a different for formulation with the different release rate, right? And when you give to the same subject, whatever the variability is most likely, of course, there will be an intra-subject variability, but mostly it's because of the difference in the dissolution rate, right? So ideally, you should be using the crossover trial for the virtual uh, for the virtual IVIVC to build the IVIVC correlation, and your formulation should be some uh, your formulation should be similar in nature. So you cannot apply the uh, you cannot build IVIVC if you have a completely different formulation, right? Let's say if you are changing the polymer in a such a way that it's going to change the release mechanism of this formulation, then you cannot build the IVIVC with that kind of a formulation. They should be a similar kind of formulation. The only difference between the mechanism shouldn't change between this formulation. The only difference between these formulation should be only the difference in the release rate can be a slow can be a fast and uh, for if you don't have a crossover virtual trial you might able to build the IVIVC but then the applicability of IVIVC becomes uh, limited when it comes to uh, applying internally for the development of other prototypes or limited when it comes to the uh, filing the application with the regulators all right. Uh, thank you, Joyce. Um, I'd like to just add that um, it will add more limitation on being able to validate the IVIVC, right? If there is the additional uh, variability between the subjects as well as between the formulations, but the program would let you run in in more in a predictive manner to start looking also at the different populations of subjects, if that's what you want it to do. But of course, you need to keep in mind the limitations that Joyce described. Um, next question was, how many virtual trial runs should we run? Um, should we do a big trial or would it be more of 10 times 25 subjects? What would be the recommendation? So the number of virtual trials uh, Ideally, what we do, like when we have individual data and we do, we know right how many subjects were enrolled in the study, then we usually try to simulate the same number of subjects. So let's say if in the study 25 were used and we have individual data for 25 subjects, then we run the 25 subjects in the uh, population in the virtual simulation just to validate the population to see whether. Uh, the virtual subjects is representative of actual subjects or not. If you have, if you don't have any individual data, and if you have a question, 
then you may want to look it up the variability aspects of the compound right how much variability is associated with this compound and accordingly you can takes into consideration the variability of the compound some statistical aspects and then you can decide the number of subjects but again keep in mind the number of subjects will definitely affect the virtual b simulation so it's a very important that you go with the appropriate number of subjects uh, for the compound that you are trying to model okay. thank you joyce um Speaking with the uh, topic of the virtual trials, um, one more question here. Um, is there a way to capture intra-individual or random variability between the crossover arms? So that's a very good question. Uh, currently, in the current version of the GastroPlus, we don't have that capacity for directly doing the intra-subject, accounting the intra-subject variability in the program. So there is no direct way you can do this kind of simulation. But do we have found some work around in the GastroPlus uh, that involves the multi-step approach and also uh, using the crossover virtual trial simulation mode. So maybe I can quickly show what you could do. That way it's better to explain. So let's say if I want to generate the population simulation and I want to account for the uh, intra-subject variability. So there are two approaches. The first approach, work first workaround, is the creating the baseline population model. So what you need to do when you click on this population simulator, you need to go to this add select function and uncheck the parameters that you think they are most likely to contribute to the intra-subject variability. And those will be most like a gastrointestinal parameter, right? Such as uh, the person fluid in colon or the small intestine, the stomach volume, or maybe transit time, the stomach, small intestine, cecum, colon, or what uh, pH is, right? So you need to un uncheck those options, which you think that might be leading to the intra-subject variability. And then you need to run your simulation. So this is the first simulation that you run by excluding the model parameters that you think are likely to introduce the intra-subject variability. That's your first run. Then you go to your, the second run that you run is by adding those parameters back. So let's say you go to your reference formulation and then you need to add back to those parameters. So you load this previous one first that you created in the first run and then in the second run, you add those parameters back and the same thing you do your for your test record third one and that's how you change this intra-subject variability that's the first thing you can do by running the baseline simulation the other way you could do is uh, let me show this from this uh, population here so this is the dot stc file right so where the program saves the population information and i told you that it gives all the detailed information what baseline parameter was used to run the population right all the model parameters individual subject profiles and also the subject parameter and results so what you could do manually and this one gives you more control for changing the parameters because here you have the control like how much uh, values you want to change for the specific parameters in first approach you are just deselecting that parameters and once you add back that parameters it's going to use this predefined distribution from the monte carlo simulation so the second approach in which you have better control in that case you open up this population simulation file and then you go to the subject parameter and results section and then you can change the any parameters that you would like to change in the model which are likely contribute to the uh, permeability or oh, sorry the uh, intra-subject variability right so you can change the stomach transit time you can say okay for subject one i would like to use two for subject three i would like to use stomach ph of three so you have that control but the only problem with this one you need to be very careful because when you make any modification to this file 
if it gets corrupted then the program won't be able to read back in the program so when you make this kind of manual adjustment in the population file itself um, always make sure that you make a copy of this pop population before you start creating a modi modification for few of the parameters in the .stc file so these are the two ways you can do intra subject uh, variability at the moment but uh, in the new version upcoming versions in the gastro plus you will have the we will we are going to add this functionality which would allow you to account for the intra subject variability between the population between the uh, sorry within the subjects um Thank you, Joyce. And just a quick follow up on this: the the new version should be coming up um, in within a couple of months or so. Um, so, if um, you do need to do a virtual trial with the intersubject variability, you could use the strategies that Joyce does, just described. But in about two months, you should have access to a version which will allow you to do it in more automated way, so without all of this extra extra work on your end. So mm -hmm. stay tuned for the new version announcements. Um, we have about five minutes left, so let's switch gears a little bit. And we have here um, some questions related more to the DDD+. Plus. Um, can I use more excipients than are used in the example? I believe, believe Valproate had um, only two excipients aside from the drug right, in, the, um, in the database mm -hmm. for those formulations. Is it possible to create more complex formulations with more excipients? Yes, you can add as many as excipients that you will have in your formulation. So the DDT Plus allows you to add as many as excipients that you would like to add. You need to just pro define those excipients. So you need to provide the uh, properties for those excipients along with the properties of the compound itself. So yes, you do have that option. And that actually leads to the next question. Is there a database of excipients? I do believe, yes, we do. Uh... So maybe I can answer maybe that can one. Answer. Uh, yeah, DDD Plus does come with a list of excipients with predefined properties. Joyce, if you go into edit formulation and click on the button import excipients, the one right above the close button. So this is showing the, the list of excipients that we have already predefined in the program with the properties that are important. So all you would need to do is add them to your formulation, define what type do you want to use them as, right? Um, the type we've defined the most typical uses, solubilizer, disintegrant, polymer, and so on. But you know that some of the excipients might have different functions depending on the on the formulation. So you would simply define what function you are using it um, for your formulation. And uh, most of the common excipients should be covered in this uh, in this list and built in uh, database. But we do extend this based on the on the requests from users and based on um, um, what excipients are missing, what uh, what excipients our users need to be using. So if there are missing ones, uh, just let us know and we'll uh, do our best to incorporate it in, in future versions. So. so I would like to add something like you can select the excipients from this uh, built-in list. If not, the user has option to uh, add the ingredients and then you can specify the additional excipient, but you need to make sure you provide all the information which are required by the model. Um, maybe we have another minute to uh, answer one more question. Um, what is the difference between performing virtual BE trials with and without an IVIVC in Gastro Plus? So yes, you can uh, run the virtual BE trial. So when you do with the IVIVC based BE trials, what we are doing, we are using the uh, correlation that best correlates with uh, in vitro versus in vivo. And we have, if you have validated, you know, internal and external validation, we have a confidence in this correlation. And that would allow us to 
uh, convert the in vitro resolution data to in vivo using this function. Uh, you can also run the virtual trial without establish without using this uh, equation. So it's a uh, more like of IVIVR, right? Because we don't have the mathematical function that clearly describes the in vitro in vivo relationship. So what you could do, you could fit the viable function to your plasma profiles using the single and double viable. So not calculating through the IVIVC and you can run the virtual B trial in that way, but it would be a, not would be a quantitative, it would be semi-quantitative approach and it would be uh, would might have some limitations or the the other strategy you would be using your in vitro data directly as an input basically making assumption that the in vitro dissolution is the same as in vivo if you don't have the IVIVC so the IVIVC gives more confidence in the in the prediction results and of course um, if you are trying to do the virtual by BE for um, immediate release formulations, you might be predicting the solution based on the particle size, solubility, and so on. So you would not be building IVIVC in that case. So it really depends on the on the use case and what you are trying to do. Um, and I think that brought us right to the um, end of this uh, this webinar. Um, Arlene, any final words to close out? Yes, thank you, Viera and Joyce. Uh, but before we end, um, user feedback is important. It's how we build and make new features and developments in the software. It's also how we generate new webinar uh, topics. So based on what you heard today, did we meet your expectations? We'll give you a few seconds here to answer. Again, virtual BE trial simulations has been a top requested webinar topic from our users. And to evaluate GastroPlus for yourself or your team, you can visit our website at www.simulations-plus.com. This concludes our webinar for today, but we'll keep the conversation going on our LinkedIn page. If you have topics you'd like to see in a future le lecture series, let us know. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow when Vieira discusses DDI predictions and more. Have a great day, everyone.